Okay. Um, it's called chapter 26. Uh, sorry, it's chapter 26, and uh, it's Mummy Comes at Night. Three days after the opposition's victory, Uncle Tiger was driving home very late after leaving Nana, Nana's home in Ridge Heights. He had gone there for some proper home-cooked food, as his own assistant, come cook, come factotum, was not too adept in the culinary arts. The, this generally suited Tiger most of the time, as he was usually of, a, of an abstemious disposition. However, there were times when he missed good home-cooked food with a warm presence of family to share it with. Hence, his occasional trips to his brother's home for this particular culinary and familial indulgence. Tiger was just about to turn onto the street on which his house was situated when he was suddenly blocked by two large cars which seemed to appear out of nowhere. He quickly jammed on his brakes to avoid, to avoid a collision and instinctively looked in the rear view mirror as well. Much to his chagrin, two other large vehicles had also moved to block his retreat. Uncle Tiger was many things, but he certainly was not a fool. He knew there and then that he had walked into an ambush from which there was little or no escape. They had been lying in wait for him. The vehicles both in front and behind him were hefty dark SUVs, though he could not ascertain their exact makes and models in the dark and lit streets. Eight men in all emerged from the SUVs and surrounded his modest Toyota Camry saloon car. Their bearing and holstered sidearms suggested to him they were government security personnel. Rational, apprehen rational apprehension of danger and not fear is our situation here, he whispered to himself, for he was truly a fearless soul. Tiger quickly pondered his options. He knew without a doubt that this was part of the crackdown on opposition leaders he and his colleagues had correctly anticipated. However, they didn't think it would be, it would be so soon given the preponderance of deep anti-government sentiments prevailing in the country in the immediate aftermath of their victory. Clearly, it now seemed that they had gravely miscalculated since he was no doubt about to be taken into custody to await his government-ordered and savory fate. What was the saying again? He asked himself and then remembered. One does not take a knife to a gunfight. However, in this case, he did not even possess a knife or, or any implement resembling such. Surely, the logical extension of such a sagacious adage was certainly militates against him bringing just his fists, which were all he had, to a fight with eight undoubtedly trained military or paramilitary goons wielding guns. Well, it seems there's nothing to do but to cooperate for now, he thought to himself as two of the men approached his, dri his driver's side window. Uncle Tiger rolled down... Uncle Tiger... Sorry. Yeah. Uncle Tiger rolled down his window and politely asked, what can I do for you, gentlemen, on this fine night? To his amazement, the reply he got was quite polite, even if a bit gruff, and certainly a far cry from the heaping of opprobium, opprobium on him and the shouting of expletives with him being dragged out of the car that he had expected. Instead, the one who responded simply said, We are with the government, and you are not under arrest, sir. And we apologize to you for stopping you in the street in this manner. However, it was necessary. You are to come with us. One of my men will one of my men will drive your car and follow us. You will have to be blindfolded, but you are not in any danger. We appeal to you to step out of your car and not resist, or we will be forced to restrain you. Again, we apologize for having to do things this way, but these are our orders. Tiger was indeed amazed that this clipped, seemingly polite and obviously rehearsed mini-speech as he stepped out of his car to cooperate. Tiger was then dri driven blindfold for about 30 minutes before the car came to a stop. The driver took so many turns of the journey that he soon gave up his spirited effort to memorize the route. He wondered whether the zigzagging pattern of driving was purposely done to prevent him from doing exactly that. Tiger had his blindfold removed the moment they arrived at their destination. He noticed they had stopped in what appeared to be a rather large, dimly lit carriage with neatly arranged car ties and sandbags against the walls. There were also guns and allied boxes of ammunition and military gear and an indeterminate, sorry, a military gear of an indeterminate nature stacked on shelves built into the garage walls. There were two seemingly new, two seemingly new Toyota Land Cruiser vehicles also parked there. 
Tiger was then led through a side door and traversed a long corridor into an average sized room with just a medium sized kitchen table in the middle of it. Two unadorned straight back chairs had been placed on opposite sides of the square table. Tiger was made to sit on one of the chairs and politely asked to wait. General Yali briskly entered the room and sat opposite Uncle Tiger. He was unarmed and in mufti. He said nothing as he sat down and simply stared at his guest. Tiger stared back and faced. They sized each other up from across the table. Both men were unafraid, though thoroughly distrustful of each other. Both were driven by both were driven by different yet equally compelling motives. The general was driven by guilt and the absolute need to protect to protect his daughter as a form of absolution or penance in the eyes of his dead wife. And Uncle Tiger was driven by the unshakable righteousness of his cause to create Odo Abkao, order, order out of chaos within his country. General Yali finally spoke. I apologize for the ignominious manner in which I dragged you here, but you and I must talk. I chose you because you are less publicly visible than your brother Nana who addressed your demonstrations. I know you hate me and everything I stand for. I know about you. I have read your file. You are a reasonable man, so let us reason. What we do here tonight affects not just our respective families, but our country as well. Do you have anything to say before I continue? Uncle Tiger quietly pondered the general's words for a few moments before replying. Bringing me here in this fashion is a bit dramatic, is it not? I thought this is the stuff of movies. I am honored though that you have a file on me. Why, but don't you have anything better to do? I don't hate you. I don't hate anyone. Your president and what you stand for are bad for this country and opposed to any notion of reasonableness and progress, so I must strive to end you and your obnoxious government. That is all. It is not personal. As to why you brought me here, I guess you'll have to enlighten me. Okay, as you wish. I'll get straight to the point. Whatever I say here, whatever I say here can never be traced back to me. I know you're an honorable man. I know about your principal fight against our Masonic orders. <coughs> I know you don't think me honorable, but that's of no consequence, so let's cut to the chase. You know I must punish the opposition leaders. I must make public examples out of all of you. I am talking about harsh punishment. The president has ordered this. I need your help in this matter. Though managing to keep a straight face, Uncle Tiger was quite puzzled and surprised at these opening remarks of this known enemy of the people. General Yali, are you normal in the head? Or as they say, have you eaten of the insane root that holds reason prisoner? You kidnapped me in the dead of night and asked me to betray my people. I thought you said you knew me. Hellfire will freeze over and exhibit truly arctic features before I betray my own brother and allies. So maybe we should stop this foolishness now and send me to your torture chambers at the BNR. I am ready. All this Uncle Tiger said with determined calmness. He was unafraid. He was indeed ready to deal with anything they could throw, throw at him, including torture. He had strenuously prepared himself for such a possibility through his constant meditation and communion with, communion with providence. The general looks at the fearless man opposite him and his, his respect for him went up a few rungs. He then proceeded to elaborate. He explained that he was, in reality, not the enemy they thought he was. He told him of things he had done, such as shipping of troops and ammunition to the war front, which, was of other, which would have otherwise been used against the marchers, ensuring that there were no open confrontations between the security forces and the marchers during the demonstration, persuading the president to desist from the use of force and to suspend the national service de decree, etc. In fact, he had done all he could to sabotage his own government and seriously cripple their security response capabilities in order to protect the very opposition group that viewed him as the most determined and implacable of enemies. Uncle Tiger just sat there and stared at the general with mounting comprehension as pieces gradually started to fall into place in his mind. Uncle Tiger looked at General Yali in wonder and, shocked, and shock at what he had just been told. The implications were huge. So that is why we got off easily. That is why we succeeded that day without any violence and bloodshed. We even joked amongst ourselves that we had a guardian angel watching over us and, clear, and clearing all obstacles in our path for us, which it appears we actually did, and, and it appears we actually did have one in reality. General Yali, so you have been our guardian angel and protector all along? Jesus Christ of holy Nazareth. How can that even be possible? Good Lord. But this was too much for him to comprehend in, in one go. 
The journal continued before Taiko could even muster the requisite courage of mind to continue. I can see from your initial expression that you believe me. The main question you must be asking yourself is the big why. You're wondering why I did all this. We don't have time for elaborate answers. So let me simply say I have much to atone for and this was part of my penance. What I'm also about to do now for your opposition group is part of my penance too. But I have an even more critical self selfish interest in all this. The general paused for a few moments and continued. Though you don't know it, my own child is one of you. My own child supports you and has aided and abetted you enormously in your campaign. Not my boy. Not the notorious troublesome one in Bruman High School you may have heard, <coughs> you may have heard of. <coughs> I mean, my gentle daughter, Zara, is one of you and she has committed high treason to support you and I must protect her at all costs. And she committed these, and she committed these acts of treason with your own famous nephew, Saga, the orphan boy. I bet you don't know... I bet you don't know they have, been, they have been secretly dating for many months now and are very much in love. Come on, Mr. Tiger. But who do you think sabotaged the military vehicles at Fort Bruman? Yes, it was my brave daughter and your equally brave nephew, Saga, who accomplished that mighty feat. Uncle Tiger's mouth involuntarily opened wide at these new and completely unexpected revelations. The sabotaging of those military vehicles that aided the opposition immensely was a mystery that had baffled them since the march and to find out that it was their own young saga and this man's daughter was just too bizarre to contemplate what in god's name are you talking about a saga and your daughter sabotaged millions of dollars of the zombie military vehicles are you off your head or are you off your head or what was all authority bewildered uncle tiger could manage by way of an answer his usually cool and calm demeanor had been considerably considerably ruffled by the amazing revelations. The general pointedly ignored his question and proceeded to instruct Tiger as to how he thought Saga, Zara, and their so far anonymous friends managed such a feat. Ma sorry. Uh, proceeded to instruct Tiger as to how he thought uh, Saga, Zara, and their so far anonymous friends managed such a feat from the evidence he had garnered to date. The general continued, when I say I need your help with the punishments, what I mean is that you and your brother must help me figure out how to play this. There must be a semblance of me having followed the president's directives while allowing most of you to escape and go unpunished. I am trying to help you some more, and you must also help me figure out how to protect my daughter and to fully cover up her involvement, to fully cover, cover up her involvement and your nephews. They did, they, did not do, they did not do it alone. There were nine other people and they must never be made to talk. By the way, your brother Nana is the only person on earth you can discuss this with. No one else. Do I have your word on this? If any of your people know we are, we are talking, there will be huge understandings and you might even be branded a traitor to your people while my boss will put me in front of a firing squad post haste as well. We must also find untraceable means to communicate without meeting like this unless extremely necessary. What do you say? What do you say? Uncle Tiger had regained his composure and renowned mental acuity and was thinking clearly now. There are many questions that need answering. Suffice it to say, nonetheless, that for now I believe you. The situation is extremely dicey for us all. I will not thank you for what you have done for us so you have done so far for us. Like you said, you have much to atone for. However, be comforted by the fact that some of your recent actions may have saved many lives, and for that I am grateful to you. I will also consult my brother and revert. As to how we will communicate, leave that with me. You'll soon find out and it'll be safe. Just give me an initial mobile number to reach you on. It should be untraceable. Be careful, you are playing a dangerous game with an unforgiving, maniacal boss. <coughs> Sorry, let me go now. Okay, Mr. Tiger, I will trust you. You can go. Your car is here. No more blindfolding. No more blindfolding as proof that I am trusting you completely. Very few people know of this secret base of mine, but now you know, as one of my men will give you directions home. I will wait to hear from you. My daughter must be protected at all costs. You may not believe it, but I am honored to meet you. Here is the number. We can only use it once. Goodbye, replied the general, who, as if having anticipated the request for a phone number, took out a small piece of paper from his breast pocket and gave it to Tiger. One of his operatives 
suddenly appeared in the room and quietly showed Uncle Tiger out. General Yali simply sat and stared at the back of his adversary. That was enough for one day. The next morning, General Yali, General Yali felt it was time to confront his daughter about her involvement in the sabotage of the military vehicles. There was no way out of this. Also, the more he knew, the more he would be better able to protect her and the orphan boy. The showdown with his daughter could thus wait no longer. The general summoned Zara into his study. She stood in front of him, slightly uncomfortable, but decidedly unafraid. She did not sit when he waved his hand to gesture that she should. In fact, before he could even utter a word, Zara preempted him by going first. She spoke in very measured, serious tones. Mommy comes to me at night, sometimes. She keeps telling me to make all of this right, all this murderous mess. Because of you, she cannot even find peace in death. I am ashamed to be your daughter. I am ashamed you are my father. Yes, I helped them. Yes, I helped them to disable those killing machines, and I am proud of it. Lock me up if you want. Let your murdering goons torture me. I don't care anymore. I did this for mommy and all those people, all those people that you and that broom and brute have been oppressing for so long. I do not fear your notorious firing squads. Kill me, daddy, and I will be at last free of your shame and I will be with mommy. The general was dumbstruck. He did not know what to say to this revelation which bordered on an epiphany. Was he himself not partly driven in recent times? <coughs> Sorry. Was he himself not partly driven in recent times by epiphanies in the form of blood besmirched ghostly apparitions of his dear departed wife? He simply looked at his daughter and heaving a sigh told her she could go and that she would speak to him. She would speak to her later. But daddy Zara started but was cut off mid-sentence. Just go Zara. Please go. I just hope that one day you will find it in your heart to forgive me. Please go, my dear, and know that no matter what has happened, and no matter what happens, what will happen, I love you very much, and I understand why you did what you did with your orphan boyfriend. It was her turn to be dumbstruck. She could not believe, she could not believe what she was hearing, and she had never seen her father look so sad and somewhat defeated. And how in God's name did he know about Saga? Her father never spoke like that, never uttered the love word. She involuntarily stifled a sob, ran out of his study and made for the sanctuary of her room where she could cry f freely and in peace. After Zara had left, the general kept his head down with his chin on his chest for several minutes, for several minutes trying to quieten his turmoil and get, and get back control of his emotions. He achieved partial success in this and then swung into action. He attacked his phones and walkie-talkie like a man possessed and proceeded to spew forth stern instructions to his underlings and commanders at the various government security agencies. Through military directives, he transferred all the guards stationed at, the, at Fort Brumman on the night of the sabotage and deliberately arranged for the paperwork on the transfers to be misplaced or at least buried for a while to come. He had already paid them handsomely to forget they ever laid eyes on his daughter. He also arranged he also arranged it so that all the post-mortem reports in the aftermath of the opposition action by the various security agents were routed, were routed through him before they were sent to the president. This way, he would be able to engender some damage control and eliminate all suspicion or evidence that would implicate his daughter. An unfettered avalanche of emotions cascaded through Zara's entire being. Her brief confrontation with her father had fueled the high state of anxiety. <coughs> Sorry about this. I have a bit of a cold. Her brief confrontation with her father had fueled the high state of anxiety she was perpetually living in these days. She lay on her bed, sobbing uncontrollably for over half an hour before sitting down to examine her own feelings clinically. What in the name of heaven was wrong with her father? How come this brash dictatorial excuse for a father was suddenly sounding so contrite? And more importantly, what business did she have? Did she have feeling sorry for her father when she was fully aware of all he had done to help bring their country to this pitiful point? And what did he what did he mean by I understand what you did? Sorry, I understand why you did what you did with your orphan boyfriend. 
And why were they being let off so easily without any fuss whatsoever, despite the enormously problematic nature of what they had done? For once, Zara could not think clearly. For once, Zara could not think clearly enough to answer any of the questions tumbling through her mind. A cluttered mind was a rare occurrence for her indeed. She desperately needed to speak to Saga. Who else in the world could she discuss such great matters with apart from her one true love, Saga? She prayed he would soon be able to tear himself away from his jubilant friends and family and come to her quickly. She simply needed to be with him. Nana had been summoned by his brother, Tiger, for what he said was an urgent meeting. It was unlike his very calm and collected brother to ask for urgent meetings, and thus had, had arrived post-haste, a tiger sprawling compound in Uso town. They were sitting in an austere room in the basement of the Masonic temple. It was adjacent to their usual meeting venue. The room sported just a desk and a few chairs, and a few chairs around it, and two brown plain-looking armchairs on which they sat. A grey wall-to-wall -wall industrial carpet on the floor did nothing to offset the decidedly spartan hue. Tiger, what is so urgent that you asked me to drop everything and come? What could possibly be the matter? I thought we had covered all bases for now. Nana asked his brother, still a little flustered. Tiger looked at his brother and calmly replied, Nana, even as children you were the most patient one amongst us. Today I need you to summon endless reserves of that patience to fortify yourself as I'm, I'm about to drop quite a few bombshells. Nana could see his brother was quite serious. He was now quite recovered and his, had regained his composure. But who is more patient than you these days, Tiger? You who speaks only a few sentences per month? When did you become such a non-talking person, my brother? I'm even surprised when you speak at our meetings. You see some of our people staring at you in shock whenever you make any statement that is more, is more than two sentences. I guess they're more used to your usual monosyllabic grunts. Nana ended with a light laugh. Nana, please be serious. That I have grown up to be a silent man of few words in my middle age is my destiny. It is born out of meditation and reflection. Are you ready to listen? Nana nodded in the affirmative and Tega began his narration, sternly asking Nana not to interrupt him until he had finished. Uncle Tiger began by briefing him from the moment he was stopped by General Yale's security men when he left Nana's home that night. Even though Uncle Tiger so spoke softly, he could see his brother's increasing concern and agitation as his story developed. Nana grew, grew wide-eyed with wonder at what he was hearing about General Yale's immense but secret assistant to the position course. He then became bewildered and very confused when he heard about Saga's amazing but outrageously dangerous actions with the help of General Yali's own daughter. He could no longer remain quiet. Tiger, please stop. Stop. Just stop for now. Are you seriously telling me that my son, our own very Saga, and his girlfriend, who somehow happens to be Yali's daughter, planned and executed an extremely dangerous mission successfully with just a few friends? A mission that the entire united opposition in this country could not make head or tail of? And have you thought of the implications? What if they had been killed? What if they had been arrested? And Yali did not know of this sabotage with all the spying that he does? Without realizing it, Nana was now standing, was now standing and had raised his voice. Image upon image of what could have gone wrong kept tumbling through his mind like, flood, like floundering items of clothing in a washing machine that wouldn't just stop spinning. He suddenly stopped his sentence, coughing uncontrollably from talking too fast. It is now thoroughly agitated state. Tiger stood up as well and gently thumped his brother on the back a few times. Nana, please sit down. You have to get a grip. This is classic locking of stable doors after horses have bolted and that's not you. You probably have the most powerful mind for reasoning amongst us. Now use that, together with the patience I asked you to summon, and calm down. Think, my brother, think. What's done is done. Yes, Saga is your son and my nephew and things could have gone badly, but they didn't. Not yet, at least. What's important is what we do now. So get a handle on your emotions, please. Uncle Tiger then paused and observed his brother, who now appeared to be calm. They both sat down again. As if, as, as if he had anticipated his brother's reaction, he reached out the side of his chair and produced a, produced a bottle of Glenfiddich single malt whiskey and two medium glasses. He filled, them bo he filled both glasses almost to the top, handed one to his brother and kept one for himself. Taking, take a big gulp and sip the rest, said to his brother, who quietly obeyed. They sat silently for a few minutes before Nana spoke. You must forgive my reaction. I am still trying to get my head around it all. Tell me something. Did Obo know about this and say nothing? Don't worry, my head is straight now. Your whiskey has helped. Good thinking. I just want to know. 
No, I don't think Obo knew. From what Yale told me, it seems we're just the two sweethearts and they're often buddies. I'm sure Ibrahim was among them. We have much to discuss. How, we react, how you react to Saga is very important. Try to imagine what the child must have gone through. Try to imagine the terrors he's probably facing now. Saga is very brave, even, even if a bit impulsive. And that Yali's daughter must be quite brilliant and courageous too. In truth, they're, bo they're both heroic. I think, I, I hear she looks like a movie star. With that, they huddled closer and began to consider and analyze everything General Yali had told Tiger step by step and stage by stage. Between the two brothers, there was the sufficiency of intellectual capacity, compassion, and common sense to guide them in determining possible solutions that would affect their families as well as many others. They certainly had much to discuss, including General Yali's request that they assist him with managing the president's directive to hunt down the opposition and destroy its leading lights, such as their own very persons. Thank you.